Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. And uh, that seems to be the theme. God has promised success. So be strong and courageous. Go in and conquer the land. And the second chapter, we learned that they delayed for a few days. You would think they'd immediately gone in. And he says, no, I'm going to send some spies out. And the reason for sending spies into the land was uh, simply so a gal by the name of Rahab, who had this epitaph, the prostitute, that she would come to know the Lord. And she, she accepts the Lord, and she is going to be spared when the city of Jericho falls. Uh, we came to the, the third chapter, and they're on their march into the land. But there's an obstacle in the way, and we talked about this last time, about how sometimes God does what I call deja vu. You know, you, have you ever been there, deja vu? You say, I've been here before. I, this has happened before. And, and what happened was they got to the, the Jordan River, and the Jordan River had exceeded its banks. And it's overflowing. And God did a deja vu event. He caused the Jordan River to stop so that they went across on dry, lound, uh, on dry ground, just like they'd done with Moses at the Red Sea. Moses lifted up his staff, the waters parted, they went across, and I want to suggest to you that God is still in that deja vu business of doing exceedingly, abundantly above whatever we ask or think just to display his greatness and that he is God. Well, that's kind of where we left off last week. They had crossed the land, across the Jordan. They're in the, the land. Uh, they're at a place that later is going to be called Gilgal. And whenever you read the scriptures, you'll find they keep going back to Gilgal, Gilgal. And uh, that's where they're at. And so today I want to talk about going up and actually conquering the land before they actually enter into their first battle. You would think now that they've crossed the land, they're within a couple miles of the city of Jericho. God has promised that they're going to capture Jericho that they would immediately go on up. But God says, hold on, hold on. You've got to prepare for success. And part of that preparation for success involves renewing your commitment. You've got to renew your commitment from time to time. It was nice this last summer. We had a, a couple that had been married for over 40 years, 50 years, I believe it was. And they said they wanted to renew their vows. They wanted to renew their commitment to one another. Were they already committed? Yeah, but they needed to re renew that commitment to one another. God, God pauses here before they can go and conquer the land. He says, it's time for you to renew your commitment. The Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Circumcision is a surgical procedure. Uh, it is the removal of the foreskin of the male genital uh, and it, it's an act that was done in the ancient world, and uh, it, it's a practice that continues to this very day. Not just among the Israelites, but among most people. Today we have uh, the, 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 a similar thing going on that is called uh, female genital mutilation, because it is not the same kind of procedure, but it is circumcision of a woman instead of a man. And, and uh, it's not very good for the female. Whereas this is a good procedure that's believe, believed to have some medical benefits. And the medical benefits are even the best when it's done on the eighth day, just as the Word of God prescribes. You can check that out at line there. Long before modern medicine, God knew exactly what was best for his people. But he says, make flint knives and circumcise the people. Now, circumcision goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. When God called Abraham out of Ur of Chaldee, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to give you a seed, and I'm, I'm going to give you a land, and I'm going to bless you, and everyone that blesses you will be blessed, and anyone who curses you will be cursed. And God entered into a covenant with Abraham. By the time you get to chapter 15 of Genesis, God has a sacrifice that Abraham gives. And he says to Abraham, slaughter some animals, and then we're going to enter into a covenant. Now, this is a blood covenant. And the way you would do that, you would sacrifice the animal and you split it. You put half on one side and half on the other. And you put half of an ox here, a half of, and you, play, you slaughter the animals. And then the two people entering into the covenant would pass through the pieces. And as you pass through what you're saying, I promise whatever I've sworn, I will do that. Or you split my body in half just like these animals, these carcasses on the ground. 
When it came time for Abraham to pass through the pieces, God made him fall asleep. And then the text says, a huge flaming fire passed through, a torch of fire passed through the pieces, and God entered into the covenant with Abraham, and Abraham didn't enter the covenant with God. It was a one-sided, lopsided covenant arrangement where God had promised, I will bless you. I will give you this land, and there's nothing you can do to stop me because if I don't do it, you got to cut me in half. <laughs> you got to kill me. Can you kill God? You can't. And so he's saying this is an unconditional, unilateral, one-way covenant I will bless you. You come to the 17th chapter and God says, okay, now it's time for you to participate in the covenant. You are, he says, you are to undergo circumcision. And it will be a sign. It's going to be a mark of the covenant between me and you. You're going to carry this around in your flesh that I am your God and that you are my people. And he says, for, for generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old, must be circumcised. Only the males were were circumcised. They must be circumcised. My covenant is in your flesh. You're going to carry it around with you. You're going to know that you belong to me and I belong to you because you carry that in your flesh. Marriage is a covenant, right? It's a covenant between a man and a woman. And a man and a woman, they promise to each other, and in order to carry around a sign of the covenant, I wear it on my finger. If you're married here, you've probably got one on your finger. Somebody said, I should just have it tattooed. <laughs> it never comes off. It's always there. It's always on. I've always got it. And that's the sign that tells somebody. Now, single, when I was a single guy, an attractive woman walked in the room, the first thing I looked at was her hand. Is she available, right? Because if she's got a ring on her finger, she's taken. She's entered into a covenant. It's a binding arrangement. It's legally somebody else's. I say, forget her. (laughs) You probably went through the same thing, right? Yeah, same thing. This is a covenant sign. And it says, you are my people. I am your God. You do this, and this in circumcision... It expressed a parent's faith. They would circumcise the child saying that they believed in the Lord God. It was their expression of their faith. Kind of like we every now and then we'll have a a child dedication service. And where the the, the baby has no idea what's going on. I've had some unusual baby dedications where the kid thought he was supposed to be preaching. (laughs) And he starts screaming, yelling, carry God, you know, all right. And, uh, uh, but we, when we dedicate, you can't dedicate another free moral agent. Everyone has to make their own decisions. But the parent is making a decision and entering into a covenant that by God's grace, I will do the very best I can to raise this child. This covenant, according to this passage, when they were circumcised, it was an expression of the parent's faith. And they were circumcising the child to bring them into the covenant community of Israel. They became part of the nation Israel. They were an Israelite. And so they're part of that community. Many people have tried to compare, and and there's some comparisons, there's some similarities between circumcision and baptism. But circumcision is not baptism, and baptism is not circumcision. In fact, in the book of Romans, it tells us that in the New Testament, uh, not that We are circumcised of heart. When we believe in Jesus, we're circumcised of heart. And we'll see why in a little while in this passage because he says the reproach of of Egypt was rolled away. We're circumcised in heart. When a person believes it's their heart that is circumcised, that stony dead heart becomes alive. The Holy Spirit blows a wind within us called the holy wind and we're born again. And that's when we're circumcised. And the person that has that faith, they're circumcised of heart. And that's what he really wanted for the nation of Israel. Not just to have a surgical operation on the outside, but in their heart, a faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In their case, in the Old Testament, in Jehovah God, to believe in him, what they were wearing in their flesh, to be genuine in their heart. To be genuine in their heart. 
My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. He goes so far as to say, as any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. Theologians wrestle with the expression cut off. Does that mean cut off as in stoned to death, executed? Or does that mean excommunicated and thrown outside the nation Israel and counted as a Gentile? Either way, you take this. God is not happy when you're not bearing the mark of who you are, of who you are. He goes so far as to say he has broken my covenant. I'm saying all this because in the book of Joshua, Israel had broken the covenant. How do I know that? What the rest of the text says. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, when they came out of Egypt, anybody over 20 years old, that was military age, over 20 years old, all the men out of over, over 20 years old, they died in the desert in the last 38 years. There's probably about a million of them died in the last 38 years. Wandering around in the wilderness. They died in the, in the, in the desert on the way leaving Egypt. All the people that came out of the land, though, they had been circumcised by their parents and they died. But the people born in the desert during their journey, all those that were 20 years old and younger during the, the journey for the last 38 years, they had not been circumcising their kids. Something happened 38 years ago. 38 years ago in our passage. The nation Israel had come to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And at Kadesh Barnea, God said, send 12 spies into the land and spy out the land. And, and get a report of the land. And when they came back, they said, oh, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's a place of blessing. It's prosperous. But there are giants in the land. We're just grasshoppers in their sight. We can't go up and fight against them. We'll lose. And they did not believe and trust in the Lord to give them the land, all except for two, Joshua and Caleb. For the last 38 years, as God had said, because of your hardness of heart, your refusal to go in and take the land, all those of military age and over, they're going to die in the wilderness. So for 38 years, there's like a million funerals going on. When the last one is, has died, he goes on said in verse 6, all the men who were military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. This disobedience was pretty radical because in that 38 years, this is what they did not do. They did not circumcise their children and they did not celebrate the Passover. They did not for 38 years. They were disobedient. God is performing miracles. Every day they'd go out and they'd get manna and they'd collect manna. And you know what happens when it happens every day? It becomes routine. You start taking it for granted. Every day when they got up and they looked, oh, over the tabernacle there was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he would say, whoa, God is in our midst. But it happened every day. Pretty soon they took it all for granted. And that's what happens to us as, as modern day Christians and believers. The moment you got saved, you got the joy of the Lord. Remember that? You just, uh, you, the euphoria of, I'm a Christian, my sins are forgiven. And, and it was all exciting. And then, then you start hanging around with these old, old Christians that had lost that and they start pulling you down. You start taking everything for granted. He says here, so he raised up their sons to take their place. 38 years, they'd all died, but their children now raised up. These were the ones that Joshua circumcised because they hadn't been circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. Jump back to verse 2 in the text. I kind of jump around in the text this morning. It says, and uh, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. None of them got circumcised the second time. It's because they had not been doing it. And he's saying, it's time to start doing 
what I have told you to do. So Joshua made the flint knives and he circumcised the Israelites in Gebeath Haraloth. And the text goes on and says, that is followed, that, that, that circumcising was actually a real test of their faith. After the whole nation had been circumcised, I gotta tell you something about circumcision. At eight, years, eight days old, none of us remembered it. Those who have been circumcised, they don't remember it. If you're an adult and you get circumcised, it is one extremely painful surgical operation. So you got a, a, a approximately like a million men needing to be circumcised. And uh, they'd been circumcised. They remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. They were really sore. They, they couldn't get up and do anything. In fact, if you go back in the book of Genesis, Levi one time, he convinced some group to get circumcised. And when they were all hurting so bad, they went in and slaughtered them all in the war because they had no defense. What this is saying is they stood there defenseless. They're one mile from their enemy. They know that there's going to be a battle. And what do they do? This is not good battle strategy incapacitate your entire male population. You know, God's ways are often bizarre. God wants you to trust him. They're often bizarre. He's going to tell them later in the book, hey, this is the way you're going to take the city of Jericho. You're going to march around it and you're going to blow your trumpet and the wall's going to fall down. And you could say, right. Right now he's saying, wait a minute. Incapacitate everybody a mile or two away from your enemy and wait a week before you go. I tell you what, waiting is one of the hardest things in the world to do. In the book of Acts, and in chapter one, Jesus ascended into heaven. He said, not many days from now, the Holy Spirit's gonna come. You would have thought, well, tomorrow or the next day. They gotta wait 10 days. 10 days. It's a test of our faith. Sometimes I'm put on hold by God just to see how I will behave. Will I act in faith or am I going to say, okay, enough of this. I'm going to do it my way. That's what uh, Sarai did with Abraham. Uh, Lord promised the baby. Well, I'm tired of waiting on the Lord. Here, take my handmaid. We'll do it my way, not God's way. You see what happens? I get so doggone impatient. It's a lack of my faith in God to trust him. It's a testing of your faith. The next part, verse, the very next verse says, then the Lord said to Joshua, after he'd circumcised them all in this great test of faith, he says, today I have rolled away <clears throat> the reproach of Egypt from you. The reproach of Egypt. What in the world is that? I like one translation. says the disgrace of Egypt. The disgrace of Egypt. Some people think it's the, the fact that they wound up in slavery in Egypt, but that wasn't really their fault. They went there and then the kings changed and, and then the one king came along and enslaved them. So that's not really their fault. Uh, and, and maybe it was uh, because they took on some of the gods of Egypt and they had to get rid of those gods of Egypt. They started worshiping the false gods. That was a reproach. I really think it's what took place in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 when the 12 spies were sent out and they came back and they gave a bad report and said, our God can't whip those giants in the land of Canaan. And they disobeyed. What a disgrace. God had said to Moses, step aside, I'm going to wipe them all out because they have no faith. And he intercedes in their behalf. And then we find in the, in the passage that Moses' intercession says, Every, all the other nations are going to say, look, God brought them out and couldn't do anything with them. What a disgrace. The disgrace was their disbelief and their, of God. And he says, the day that they obeyed the Lord to follow him in circumcision was the day they rolled the disgrace away. And so the place has been called Gilgal. The word Gilgal is built off that word, roll away. How many of you ever remember from a Sunday school days, years gone by, where he sang, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away? Anybody remember that song? Every burden of my heart rolled away. Rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. All my sin had to go neat the crimson flow. Rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. Every burden of my heart rolled away. That's what happened that day. All the shame, the disgrace, everything that had to do with their disobedience and wanting to go back into Egypt, it rolled away. On the day they recommitted themselves to the true 
and living God. It all rolled away. Preparation involves removing that reproach of your past. For them it was the reproach of Egypt. For us it was the reproach of the old life, the, the world, and all that goes with it. But it's also, preparation is remembering your salvation. Right there in the presence of the enemy, they're going to have a time of remembrance. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, it must have been the month of Abib, the first month in their calendar, 14th day of the month. They, years ago, 40 years ago, exactly for them, God had instructed Moses on that day and that night, the angel of the Lord was going to go through Egypt and was going to strike down the firstborn son of every, every home in Egypt except where the blood of a lamb was shed and put on the doorposts and the lentil across the top. Because if that blood was there, when the angel of the Lord went through to slay as a plague on Egypt, the last one, he would pass over the home where the blood was applied. That was Israel's salvation. When we went through this a year ago in the book of Exodus, that, that night there was a wailing in all of Egypt. And I like that little text that said, but not a dog even barked. It was miraculous. Wailing of all the people because their firstborn had died, except for those who applied the blood. Now, now the picture here is obvious. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And it is without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Jesus' blood was shed on the cross for our forgiveness of sins. And when that blood is applied to our hearts, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness because his blood has been shed abroad on the cross and on our hearts and washed and cleansed us from our sins. When we accept Jesus, God then looks down, sees the blood of Jesus applied to our hearts, and he passes over us. Forty years ago that had happened. And for the last 38 years, they had stopped celebrating it. They, for, they, they forgot it. They, they, they just were deliberately disobedient. Now, part of circumcising everyone was really important because according to Exodus chapter 12 and 13, if you were not circumcised, you could not partake of the celebration of the Passover. You were to be cut off if you took of it and you weren't circumcised. They had to make preparation of their commitment by being circumcised, rolling away the reproach of Egypt, all that was behind, leaving the old life behind, and then celebrating the salvation of God that he had delivered them out of slavery and bondage in Egypt. And they had this meal that they partook of to not forget. It's kind of like the Lord's Supper behind me here. It too is a celebrating meal. In fact, Jesus said, uh, you do proclaim the Lord's death until I come when you partake of this meal. Like the meal that they had, it, it reflects back upon a sacrifice. Theirs was the animal, the little lamb that was slain and blood applied to the post. Ours is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They had to prepare for this meal, making all the preparations. Being circumcised was really important. One. Knowing Jesus as your Savior, having your heart circumcised by the Lord. Being born again, that's important. Following him in believer's baptism is important. It's a command of the Lord. And we come to the table prepared. They had to prepare to take the Lord's Supper. In the New Testament passage, what we'll read in a little while, it's going to say, but let a man examine his own heart. It's not my job to examine your heart. You will reflect as you get the elements. You are to reflect and say, Lord, is there anything between me and you that I need to remove? Is there something I need to roll away to confess and get out of my life? Because if I confess it, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin it's applied to my heart and washed away, and I partake of the meal and the fellowship in the Lord. 
is so wonderful and so sweet. You remember your salvation. Part of preparing for success is enjoying your blessings right now. Right now. On the day after Passover, they celebrated the Passover. That very day, he wants you to know, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. Oh. They were participating in a whole new life. For 38 years in the wilderness, it was the same old manna every day. How would you like that? 38 years and you had the same burger every day. I know some of you do the same. You have the same eggs every morning. 38 years. But you try to mix it up the rest of the day. But it was manna at breakfast, manna at lunch, manna at supper. For 38 years, they got complaining. God sent them quail a few times. They did the things. But it was the same old stuff every day. And it was miraculous because they didn't work for it. God just provided it. But he said, now you've come to what I promised you. This is the blessing. This is the land. This is your new life. Go in and partake of it. Have some of it. Enjoy it. And so the day after that very day, they ate of the produce of the land. They had unleavened bread. They didn't even wait for it to leaven. They, they, they made their grain and out of it, and then they made their, their bread, and they had roasted grain. It's about it, it, taking advantage of the very moment. Some of us, we don't enjoy every day as we ought. Some of us try to live in the past. Oh, man, I remember what we had... Remember that wonderful bologna sandwich I had last week? <laughs> Remember how wonderful it was? The good old days. The manna stopped. It was a miracle. It had gone on for 38 years. And God said, I am done providing. I put you in the land that I promised you. Now you go in, possess the land, and take all the blessings from the land. Listen, I came to Christ as an eight-year-old boy. I then followed that in baptism and I entered into a whole new life. A whole new life. And God has blessed in my life, but he wanted me to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. In order to do that, I had to participate in certain things. I had to get into my Bible and read because I can only glorify God to the extent that I know him. If I don't know him, I can't glorify him. I can't grow in my faith. I can't get all the blessings from the land. I had to follow him in believer's baptism because that's the next thing. Be obedient. He says, repent and be baptized. I, I was then a member of the church. I was involved in the church. God has gifted every single one of us to do something in the church. You say, well, but maybe I'm too old. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Moses didn't start doing anything until he was really 80. <laughs> he didn't quit until he was 120. God has something for you to do. The manna stopped. The miracle stopped. There was no longer manna for the Israelites. They weren't living in the past anymore. And some of us got to say, you know what? I'm not living in the past anymore. I'm going to seize what God puts in my life today. And the very last part, you got to focus on the future. But that year, they ate of the produce of Canaan. God is going to provide for me, for my family, for my church, what I need for this coming year. God is going to provide. And I focus on what he will do rather than be distracted by the rearview mirror of everything that he used to do. He's saying, no, I've got greater things that I'm going to do through you. But get your eyes off the rearview mirror, get them on the front view, and start looking for what I am going to do. I want to sum it all up. You can prepare for success right now, today. You can prepare for success. It's pretty simple according to this passage. You cut off and you roll away your Egypt, your past, the world. You cut it off, you just roll it away. You just say, you know what? I'm not going to get bogged down by the past. And then you start feasting off of the fruit of the new life. The feasting off the fruit of the new life, he gave us the Spirit of God. If I walk by the Spirit, I will not 
make any provisions for my flesh, if I walk by the Spirit, all right, I'm not going to get bogged down by the world. If I walk by the Spirit, I'm going to enjoy all the nine fruit of the Spirit. It's one fruit that he, pro he produces in my life. I've just got to cut off the past, roll it away, focus on the future. Let's pray. Father in heaven, prepare our hearts now. Some of us need to do that recommitment that they did. We need to recommit ourselves and our heart and our faith and our trust in the Lord right now as we partake of the Lord's Supper. We're to examine our own hearts and see if there's anything there that needs to go. And we can roll it away and enjoy your presence, your blessing, communion, fellowship, between me and you, my soul and my God. Lord, for some of us, there are things in our lives that need to be dealt with. And we need to take care of them so that we can come prepared for the Lord's Supper and prepared for the success that follows. Bless us in our preparation time now for the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen. song that I am convinced and committed to him because he's going to keep, keep me 
unto that day. It's about commitment. He's committed, but he wants us committed to him too. Go away today with the thought that I'm going to commit myself to him and live for him today and for the rest of the week. I invite you to come back this evening. We have several prayer requests that came in today. We will be sure and pray with every one of those this evening. We have a lot of other prayer, prayer items that we'll have. You can either participate in prayer or just be a spectator in our prayer. It doesn't matter. You will be blessed if you come 6 o'clock this evening for our concert of prayer. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.